Today, let's talk about finding a streama of functions of multiple variables. So to start off as usual, let's kind of give ourselves a review of things that we already know. So uh, back from single variable calculus, we have two concepts. We have the concept of local um, and absolute extrema. Um, absolute is sometimes also called uh, global global minimums and maximums. Um, and as the picture shows here, we've got a function. Let's say we just name this function f or something. Uh, and as we look at as we look at the uh, graph, we can clearly see that, hey, at this point right here, the graph, well, we're assuming that it just extends in that direction. But uh, for what we can see of the graph, there's nowhere where it gets lower than that point. It's going to, the outputs are always going to be above that point. So that's a minimum value for the output. And it occurs at, oh, I don't know, the input of what it looks like, 0.3. And then over here, we've also got a something that we could think of as a minimum value. It's kind of like a, a little valley, but it's not global in that it's not overall the lowest point, but it is a minimum with respect to nearby inputs. Um, so, you know, everything in that little zoomed in corner, we would consider it a minimum, but it's a local minimum because it's only a minimum with respect to nearby inputs. Um, the same concepts apply to local maximum here. We've got a, a local maximum area where it's kind of a hump on the graph where it's the highest point for all nearby inputs. And then over here, uh, well, I, I mentioned that, hey, we're assuming this thing goes on like this, but when we use the words global, it's uh, it can be used for either a function that we have a restricted domain for. And that's the example we're looking at right here. We're gonna, since this, this plot stops right here, we're only interested in the minimum and maximum values attained over this restricted domain. And so up here, we consider this to be a global maximum because over that restricted domain, there is no higher output value. Now, if we did not have this restricted domain, and if we let this function run off to infinity, presumably it just continues to do something like this. Although, who knows? If we knew the actual formula, maybe it could do something like that. It doesn't. Let's just say it goes up and up and up. In that case, this, this global maximum would no longer be a global maximum because the function just runs off to infinity. So in this instance, this, if we didn't have the restricted domain, it would not have a global maximum. It would only have global minimum, a local minimum, and a local maximum, but no overall global or absolute maximum. All right, so we're gonna, as usual, extend this idea into three space. And I think this plot does a really nice job of illustrating that same kind of a concept. Um, here we're not, we are looking at a restricted domain so we're just considering the, the portion of this visible surface. And we see that there are a couple local minimums and local maximums, as well as an absolute min and an absolute max. Again, the highest Z output values uh, with respect to the inputs that we're interested in. Over here, this is clearly the highest point. So it's the absolute maximum over this restricted domain. But then down here at this local max, that's still a maximum, but it's just with respect to nearby inputs. If we would collapse that down into the xy plane, we'd see just those inputs nearby correspond to the points on that plane on the surface like this. Uh, again, if we were to let this thing extend off and, and let the plane go out in lots of directions, presumably it would just keep going off uh, flat in the xy plane as it appears to do so. Now we actually would have an overall, an absolute or global maximum. However, if, uh, if for the inputs as y goes off in the positive direction, this surface does something like this, you know, all of the points of the surface run off like that, then we would no longer have an absolute maximum. We would just have, this would become a local maximum value. So the point I'm trying to make is you have to be a little bit careful with the vocabulary here um, with respect to whether you're talking about an unrestricted domain for the function or a restricted domain. Sometimes uh, whether it's a local or an absolute max can be, um, different. And if you have an unrestricted domain, the function doesn't always have to have an absolute or global maximum value. Same goes with minimum. Um, however, whenever you have a restricted domain, like we have in this, this kind of example here, over a restricted domain, there's a theorem, we're going to omit the name here, 
Uh, but there's a theorem that says, yeah, a function will attain an absolute minimum and an absolute maximum value over a restricted domain. And hopefully the picture can convince us as to why that's reasonable. Because uh, it can't run off any further. We're looking at, yes, an infinite number of inputs, but we can analyze it over those inputs and say, OK, yeah, there has to be a minimum and a, uh, maximum values overall that occur. OK, so what types of extrema do we have? Well, back from single variable calculus, as that first slide kind of showed, we just have two types, minimums and maximums. So let's see how this changes when we're dealing with multiple variables. As usual, let z is equal to f of x, y be a function on an open set that has an interior point, x naught, y naught, in this open set x, or s, rather. Then uh, the absolute or global extrema are higher, quote, higher. I'm thinking of the uh, output. You know, Z is the vertical output as we usually kind of think of it. And so using the word higher there, then all of the other points in a, that correspond to domain points. So the formal way to say that is if you have Z naught is equal to F evaluated at X naught Y naught, it's greater than F of X Y for all X Y in that set. If it's the, the got the highest output value, X naught will be an absolute maximum where Z naught will an absolute maximum occurring at x naught y naught the input value similarly for an absolute minimum it will be the quote lowest value the lowest value attained by the function over that restricted domain with respect to relative um, extrema so you've got relative or local extrema and they're higher or lower than quote nearby points on a domain and if you were to write that out I'll let you read that and it's in the textbook as well. But I think the intuitive way to think about it is probably the best. All right, so again, types of uh, extrema. This time we're looking at two dimensions in the plane. We had maximum values and minimum values that could occur. Now that we've extended this into three space, we have maximums and minimums, but we also have a new type of kind of extrema called a saddle point. And so here's a picture of a saddle point. And what it is is informally, it's a point where there are always nearby points both below and above the point. And so this one over here, that's an absolute, or a, not absolute, that's a relative minimum, or <laughs> messing up all the words. That's a relative maximum value. So what we're interested in here, the saddle point is this little guy. Why is that little guy a saddle point? Well, if you look at the surface, it looks like it's, decreasing in that direction. But if you were to walk in this direction, uh, the surface the outputs of, are increasing. So we've kind of got, there are, no matter how small of a, of a circle I kind of, or any kind of a domain I, I would draw around that point, I could find points that are both below and above it. And I jokingly have extrema, maybe. Well, in the same way that, a uh, local minimum is still a type of extrema. It's just not the overall minimum. Saddle points are interesting, and so we consider them a, a type of extrema as well. All right, back to single variable calculus. Where could extrema occur? Uh, they happened at critical points. And so just like the single variable calculus, a critical point, input, uh, input x naught y naught of some function z is equal to f of x y is a point where either well, in single, whoops, let's put that back into focus. In single variable calculus, it was good enough to have the first derivative be equal to zero. But for multivariable calculus, we have to have both partial derivatives equal to zero. Or in single variable calculus, it was good enough that the first derivative was undefined. And in this case, when multivariable calculus, we have either or both derivatives are undefined. So there's a subtlety here. Um, if either one is undefined, it's a, it's a critical point, a potential place where a minimum and a maximum could occur. Whereas if you're looking at the partial derivatives being zero, you need both, both partial derivatives to be zero for it to be a critical point. It's not good enough for just the x partial derivative to be zero, but the y to be four or some other number, they both have to be zero. Either or undefined, both need to be zero. All right. so. Here's a theorem, critical points and local extrema. If a function f has a local extreme value, then p is a critical void of f. So careful with this one. This doesn't say the reverse. This doesn't say that if you have a critical point, you're guaranteed to have an extreme value. It just says if you have an extreme value, then you know a critical point. 
So I don't find it necessarily the best uh, theorem, but you can use it. You can find a local extrema and then you could test whether it's an extreme value. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Sometimes this is the equivalent of the first derivative test in single variable calculus. So we could stop here and try to use what we know about directional derivatives and critical points to try and find and classify extreme values, but there is a better way. And again, recall from single variable calculus that the second derivative tells us about concavity. Uh, I never know how to say that, concavity, concavity. I usually say concavity. If anybody knows, feel free to drop a comment. And can be used to classify types of extrema. So if you have a critical point and you have it concave up, in single variable calculus, your graph is concave up, then it has to be a minimum. Well, that why does that make sense? Well, you've got a critical point, that means your first derivative is going to be zero. Geometric interpretation, the tangent line is horizontal. Uh, so if it's if it's concave up, sure enough, we could see that it's a minimum. Whereas if it's concave down, uh, it's a critical point, so it's got a horizontal tangent slope. Sure enough, that's a maximum as well. So does this extend to multivariable calculus? So Consider a potential maximum. Is it good enough to confirm that our graph is concave down in the x and y directions alone? So no is the answer to that one. It, while uncommon, it, it's possible that it could uh, decrease in different directions and then increase in other directions other than just strictly the x, y directions. You could have some kind of a wavy, wavy graph, if you will. So let's enter something here called the Hessian matrix. So let H be a matrix of second partial derivatives for some function Z is equal to F of X, Y with continuous first and second partial derivatives. So H is the matrix of second partial derivatives. The first row are the X and the Y partial uh, with respect, the second partials for the X uh, first partial. And then the second row is the X and Y second partials for the first y partial, if you will. So the derivative, it, tur it turns out that the derivative of this matrix tells us about the concavity. And, and, and as such, it can tell us about whether a critical point is an extreme value or not. So consider the derivative of a two by two matrix. We know that you multiply those and then you subtract in the other direction. There you go. So you got your formula for the derivative of your two by two matrix, the second partial, uh, fxx, fyy minus fxy minus fyx. That's the derivative. It is very common to rewrite this derivative. Um, oops, yeah. Yeah, to rewrite the last term as the fxy squared because mixed partials are equal for continuous functions. And we said that we have a continuous first and second partial derivative. So our, the mixed partials will always be equal in this case. Um, in our text, there's no mention of the Hessian matrix. Instead, they just say, hey, D is equal to this formula, right? D is equal to this formula. But it's kind of neat to know where that formula comes from. It is uh, the determinant of the Hessian. So instead of just saying capital D, I'm going to, I'll always talk about the determinant of the Hessian. Okay, now for our second derivative test. Uh, so let Z would to f of x, y be a differentiable function with continuous first and second partials and a, b be a critical point of f, then you can apply the second derivative test using a, b as your input um, to determine what type of local extrema you have. And since the equation that you use to calculate the determinant of h is equal to what? Well, it's equal to these two uh, second partials being multiplied together, and then you subtract the other two partials being multiplied together. And since they're equal, we'll just write it as that squared. Well, what do we know about this? Well, if you look at this equation, that's always going to be positive because it's squared. So there's kind of nothing interesting to know there. However, there are two other possible outcomes. Um, with, okay, let me say that again. However, the second derivative test, what we need to consider is we need to consider or what tells us something is the sign of the determinant of h. So you got two possible uh, things that you can have when it comes to the sign of the determinant of a, our Hessian matrix. Um, it can be positive, or it can be negative, or it could be zero, because technically zero is right in the middle. Um, I'm not going to argue about whether it's defined to be positive or negative, or just because say if it's zero, it's neither positive or negative. It's where the signs switch. So let's look at positive. If you have the determinant of h is positive, what what two situations could you have? Well, you could have a larger positive number 
subtracting a smaller positive number to give you a positive number. Now that's going to happen when you have a local minimum. You could also have a two negative numbers being multiplied together to give you a larger positive number, subtracting a smaller positive number to give you a positive outcome. And this happens when we have a local maximum. And then the third possibility is that you have a negative sign for the determinant of the Hessian. And that happens, well, this is always going to be positive. So how do you get a negative when you subtract a positive value? You have to have a, I'm using air quotes here for larger, technically it's smaller because um, the more negative a number, it's, it's ne smaller, but sometimes you can think of, what am I blathering on about? Uh, technically negative 1000 is smaller than negative 100 because it's less than, but sometimes it's intuitive to think of this as a larger negative number, if you will. So if you're a, if your saddle point, at a saddle point, you're going to have opposite signs for your non-mixed partials, if you will. And they'll give you a larger negative number, air quotes around larger, uh, that you subtract the positive value from and get a large uh, negative result. Okay, if you get zero, when you look at the uh, determinant of H, well then this test is inconclusive. But if you get a positive or negative number, you can then use this test to determine what type of extrema you're looking at. So a little bit of foreshadowing here. Where can uh, extrema occur? Well, critical points, we talked about that. However, we didn't mention the boundary of the domain here. Well, uh, what do I mean? Let's draw a real quick picture. Um, in Calc 1, if like that very first image that we had, we could consider critical points over a restricted domain here. Sure, maybe the function does something like this. Maybe, we, maybe it does, we don't care because all we're interested in is this restricted domain. And when I, well, I kind of drew it nicely to illustrate my point, where do we have, what interesting points do we have? Well, I see a local minimum. Actually, that's a, both a local and an absolute minimum over this restricted domain. That's a local minimum, that's a local maximum. And I'm gonna modify my picture a little bit. Let's just say that that one's clearly a little bit higher than the other endpoint there. And now we have, Sure, this, the end point of our domain restriction, it's not at a critical that it's not at a critical point, but the end point of our domain restriction gives us an absolute maximum. So when we extend this idea that we have to check both critical points and the boundary of our domain, it's not just the endpoints anymore, because as we'll see, uh, a domain in three dimensions is a region in the plane that we're interested in, say we're interested in the surface over the unit circle, well, then we would have the boundary of the unit circle, but we'd also have to check all of the inputs in the middle as well, the interior. So it's not just the endpoints of our domain. Okay, so in general, here's the method when you're looking to find and uh, classify extrema. First, you find any critical points and you find the boundary points. Then you apply the second derivative test to determine what type of extrema you have. So let's do an example. Uh, let's let z equal to f of xy, right, as usual, and the function is x to the third minus 3x minus y squared plus 4y. First things first, let's identify the critical points slash boundary points. So we will take the first partial with respect to x and get 3x squared minus 3. We'll take the partial with respect to y and get negative 2y plus 4. So what critical points come out of this? Well, uh, are either of these undefined? I don't have it typed out, but we have to think, are they undefined? And I think, I bet you that's probably the next bit. Yep, there we go. Oh, I didn't type it. All right, so are either of these undefined? Nah, you can plug any old number into there, you're gonna be just fine. Similarly, plug any number in there, you're gonna be just fine too. So there are no undefined values to worry about. So all we have to do is set these things equal to zero and solve them, which is what we're gonna do here and here respectively. So looking at 3x squared minus 3 equals to 0, a little bit of algebra will get you x is equal to plus or minus 1. Similarly, negative 2y plus 4 equals to 0 will get you to y equals 2. So it looks like we have critical points when x is plus or minus 1 and y is equal to 2. So putting all this together, you're going to end up with these critical points. Do we have any boundary points? Well, we haven't restricted our domain here. We've just said, find any extrema of this function overall. So since there's no res domain restriction, there are no boundary points or interior uh, 
boundary points to worry about. All right, so we've got summarized what we know so far. We've got our function, we've got our two critical points where we have potential minimums and maximums. Looks like there's a typo here, which I'm gonna put money on that it's just gonna repeat on the following slides, but one of those should be negative. All right, so let's go ahead and calculate the determinant of our Hessian matrix, the second derivative test. You can calculate this in general. You don't have to first plug in your inputs, you can, Plug in the inputs. There's nothing wrong with that. And what I mean is, um, before we would take this, we know that f. Whoops, let me get a pen. We know that the partial with respect to x is equal to um, six x, and we know that the partial with respect to y is minus two. Uh, wait, I, I'm getting those wrong. Those are what's on the screen. Let's go back just a little bit. What are where are those partials? I should be able to do this, shouldn't I? Yeah. There we go, 3x squared. All right, so the initial partials, 3x squared minus 3, negative 2y plus 4. There we go. And then you could take your uh, second partial with respect to x, and you would get 6x. And then similarly, your second partial with respect to y, and you would get minus two. Now you could first uh, evaluate this thing using your input of one in here and say, okay, when I evaluate this thing, uh, well, let me just write it this way. Determinant of the Hessian matrix evaluated at uh, one comma two would be, well, six times one, six times one for our X values is gonna give us just six and then zero, zero, and then minus two is just a constant, so nothing to do there. All right, and so if we evaluated that determinant, we would say, okay, that's negative 12, which is what we'll see if we were going to go over here and evaluate this thing at one comma two as well. So the point is you can put, you can uh, evaluate the second partials first before you calculate the Hessian, or you can calculate the determinant of the Hessian in general and then evaluate the points. Since we have multiple points to consider, I'm gonna go ahead and calculate the determinant of the Hessian in general first. Okay, so now we'll evaluate that at negative one, two, our first input. And so we see that we get a positive number. And if we think back to that second derivative test, when you get a positive determinant of the Hessian, you have either a minimum or a maximum. We don't know which one yet, we'll come back to that. But we know, yep, cool, either a minimum or a maximum. Now, when I use the input one comma two, uh, evaluate in the term of the Hessian, I get a negative value. If we think back to that second derivative test, the negative result of the determinant of our Hessian means that we have a saddle point. So there we go. What we know so far, we've got a saddle point at one comma two, and we have a potential minimum, or, well, not a potential, we do have a minimum or a maximum. We just don't know which one it is. So to figure that out, we need to figure out the sign of the uh, the two non-mixed partials, if you will. The second partial with respect to x has a sign, a negative sign when we evaluate it at the input point negative one, two. The second partial with respect to y here, whoops, spoiler, the second partial with respect to y evaluated at this input point is also negative. And if we go ahead and look at our second derivative test, we say, hey, when these things happen, when I have them both negative, that's when I have a maximum value. This is sort of an abbreviated version of the sec derivative test. It doesn't have that uh, squared mixed partial column in it because in a lot of ways we don't need it. What we need to know is we need to know the sign of the determinant of the Hessian and then the sign of the, what I'm gonna call the non-mixed partials. And that gets us to our result. Okay, now revisiting the picture, this was the original picture of the that we showed at the very beginning that said, hey, here's an example of these concepts. And sure enough, we can kind of see that at, a, at negative one, two over here, we've got ourselves a local maximum. And then over here at one, two, we've got ourselves a saddle point where it's decreasing in some directions and increasing in others. 
All right. So that's how you find extremum and use the second derivative test or the hash determinant of the Hessian matrix to classify extrema. What about constrained optimization? And constrained optimization is just a fancy way of saying, let's restrict ourselves to looking at a specific domain, not the entire xy plane, but just a restricted region in that plane. So you're constrained, if you will. Um, optimization means find the minimum and maximum value. So. So while we can look and find local minimum and maximum values for functions in general, sometimes we're only interested in extreme values on a restricted or constrained domain. The process is the same, but we have to ensure that we check all the boundary points. And I'm going to put and interior points too, as we'll see. So not just the vertices. Remember the first. Uh, or a single variable calculus example I had where I had this graph and I said, hey, we're interested in the minimum and maximum over this domain. And we had to check just the endpoints. Well, in this case, we're gonna need to check not just the endpoints, but every point on any boundary and interior of our restricted domain. So let's keep going with the example that we've got uh, running so far. But this time I'm gonna restrict our domain to a region in the xy plane that's enclosed by sort of the upside down parabola y is equal to negative x to the squared plus three and the horizontal line y equals one. So here's a picture of the domain restriction. It's uh, sure enough that upside down parabola and then y is equal to one. And I went ahead and put on here things we know so far. It happens that the way I chose this and wrote this example, our minimum, our maximum value that we found our local maximum and our saddle point are both on the boundary of the domain. This doesn't have to be the case. I could have chosen some other parabola or some other shape, like maybe a triangle here. And then those two points would no longer be on the boundary, but they still could be the minimum or the maximum value. So we just have to concern ourselves with not just the boundary points, but the interior of the boundary as well. Um, those links are active, but uh, it kind of spoils uh, spoils things, so we're not going to head over to it until later. But you can kind of see, yes, it looks different from the image I will admit I stole from the textbook. But it does show if we let our, our, our regular old f function that we've been looking at so far uh, go off in more directions, it kind of doesn't, it does more interesting things. But there's an image, that orange image on that blue surface, that corresponds to uh, the sort of projection of the domain up onto the surface, the related output points related to those input points on the domain on that surface. Okay, so then in general, there's kind of three things we have to do. We have to analyze the interior of our domain restriction. Um, note that we've already found all extreme and saddle, extreme uh, minimum or maximums and saddle points for this function. We did it in general with no, no domain restriction. We came up with those two points. Uh, this won't always be the case, but because if you're given a problem and just asked to find the minimums and maximums over the restricted value, you'll have to do that process that we did prior. Identify all the possible ones. Maybe one will be outside the domain, so you don't care about it, but maybe one will be inside of it. You do have to take that into account. So, so far we know that. We know we have a saddle point and a local maximum, and those are at those points. Then we have to analyze, since we've considered the interior of our domain restriction, now we have to analyze the boundary of our domain restriction. Um, and in this case, this particular example, we have two boundaries to consider. If you had something over a square, you'd have four boundaries to consider. It just depends on the particular case. And there are a bunch of examples in the course site uh, with different shaped domains, if you will. So what are our two boundary lines? We're gonna have that horizontal line, y is equal to one. And then we're gonna have the upside down parabola. It's not really upside down, I guess. So I like to call it upside down. All right, so first things first, we're gonna look at the domain boundaries individually. And then last but not least, we'll look at the vertices of those uh, domain restrictions. Because sometimes the vertices don't come out in the wash. We don't run into the vertices. We have to remember to double check those vertices at the very end. So that's why I put that as a third and additional point to look at. Always remember to check your vertices even if they don't come up in the process of looking at the bound, individual boundary lines. So first, our boundary constraint of y is equal to one. When you let y be equal to one, you're gonna get kind of a new function, if you will, excuse me. 
Okay, so let's do it. Let's let's look at what does our function become when we replace uh, y with the constant one. So you guys know I like this particular notation, so I use that. But it, it is the same thing as just saying f of x comma one. So go ahead and substitute that value one in for y, and then simplify it. That's a pretty easy game to play. We get ourselves a new function. Y is equal to x squared, or I shouldn't say y. I should say f is equal to x squared minus three x plus three. Along that line, our function looks like a parabola. I'm gonna pause and pull up the graph because I think I can illustrate a good point here. All right, so I've got the graph open on another page, but I realize I've made a mistake. So let's, let's address this mistake. That's not a two, that's a third power right there. So that has to be a third power. All right, so what do we know about uh, just, just considering this function right here? Just considering that. Well, I know we're not working in the x, y plane, but pretend we were, uh, you could say, okay, that would, if this was out of the context of this problem, if this was what we were interested in, we know that that looks like some kind of a cubic. So let's head over to the graph. Whoops, wrong button. There we go. And now I'm trying to kind of aim this so that you can see, hey, if we're looking at this, then the vertical axis it would be the y axis. And that boundary right there, sure enough, follows kind of a cubic curve, just a restriction of that particular cubic curve. So if we were to slice the graph right along that y equals one vertical plane, we would get that little uh, cubic line there. And so along that boundary, we're just interested in potential minimums and maximums of the function along that boundary. And they're kind of spoiler alert, they're already labeled on there. So let's see if we can do the math to convince ourselves that those labels are correct. All right, so now this basically becomes a single variable calculus problem of finding extrema for this quote unquote new function, which is really just our original function restricted to, um, restricted to y equals to one. So let's go ahead and write this up like this. So what is our, how do we find the extreme values of this function? Well. So what we need is we need to say, okay, extreme values can occur at critical points. So I need the critical points of this quote unquote new function, this function, which is our restriction to y equals one. So I need to calculate the first derivative of this thing. Well, the first derivative of this function here is gonna be three x squared minus three. Okay, so what critical points are we gonna have here? Well, critical points can occur when the first derivative is either undefined, and that's not a problem in this case. Uh, no, we could plug any number into x and be just fine. But we also could have it when it's equal to zero. 3x squared minus three equals to zero, factor out the three. x squared minus one equals to zero. x plus one, x minus one. Multiply both sides by one third if you like, and it leads you to x is equal to plus or minus one. Okay, so we've got critical points at x is equal to plus or minus one. So now you might be looking at this thing and thinking, oh, wait a minute, we already know about x when it's plus or minus one because we had earlier, we had found negative one comma two and one comma two. Those are a saddle and a local maximum. I don't remember which is which, they may be in a different order of that. But these are not the same x equals to ones. These are a long, the restriction of y is equal to one. So you put all that together and what points do we have? Well, if y is equal to one always along this restriction, then y is gonna be one. And then x, okay, so this comes from there. And then the x values come from here. Negative one, one and positive one, one. We have two more points to check that our potential minimums and maximums of this surface just restricted to this, this, uh, this domain. All right, now on to the next one. Okay, so now we're ready to, to look at the, the boundary of the, our, our, the second boundary constraint that we haven't looked at yet, the uh, parabola. So y is equal to negative x squared plus three. 
So if we take and we plug y is equal to negative x squared three into our function, everywhere you see a y, you substitute in the expression negative x squared plus three, you're gonna get this. And there's quite a bit of algebra that happens from here to here, but it's nothing you guys can't handle. Uh, so do that algebra and you'll see that our function restricted to that parabola domain is gonna be negative x to the fourth power plus x to the third plus two x squared minus three x plus 21. Now we need to find the critical points of this. So I'm gonna tidy up the typing a little bit on the screen, summarize what we just found out and we'll move forward from there. All right, so now we need to find the critical points of this new quote unquote new function over this domain restriction. So to do that, we need to calculate the first direction first derivative of the function under, over this domain restriction. So this first derivative becomes that. All right. And from there we say, okay, well, where are the critical points of this function? Well, in order to do that, we're gonna have to ask, is it undefined anywhere? Nope, you can plug any old number into this and be just fine. So the question is, uh, we need to set this thing equal to zero. So in order to set this thing equal to zero, first, we're gonna to need to factor this thing. Let me see if I can tidy up the screen. It's getting a little blurry. All right, so I apologize for the blurriness of the screen, but hopefully you can still read it. Okay, so what I did was I went ahead and graphed this to help me out. And I noticed that, okay, I see that I've got uh, roots of negative one and one. And so if I put that together, what this tells me is that x minus one and x plus one are factors of this function. And so that means that x squared minus one is also a factor if I multiplied that out. So what we're going to do to factor this is we're going to fire up some long division. And it's been a minute since um, potentially some of you have done long division. So I'm going to go, I don't know, hopefully at a good pace where it makes some sense. All right, ready? Grab under your hats. It's time to do some polynomial long division. Negative four x to the third plus three x squared plus four x minus three. All right, uh, I'm gonna restart this program because the blurring is bothering me. I'm sure it's bothering you too. There we go. Sometimes when computers are acting up, you just need to restart them. All right, back at it. We're going to divide this thing by the factor we know, x squared plus 0x minus 1. Remember, if you're doing long division, you have to account for every single power all the way down to x to the 0 or the constant power. So since we don't have an, uh, a linear power of x to the first, we're going to add plus 0 in there. All right, I'm dividing some expression by, by three terms. So I know that I'm going to have Whatever I put up here, I'm gonna multiply by this jazz and subtract it down there. So I know I'm gonna need three uh, terms. All right, so I want to get rid of, I want the first term to subtract to zero. So I want this to be negative four X to the third. So what do I put here to multiply by X squared to get that? Well, I'm gonna need a negative four and I have two X's, I need three X's, I'm gonna need an, and x. Negative 4x times x squared gives me negative 4x to the third. And negative 4x times 0 is plus 0x. x times x, though, is x squared. So uh, notice that the powers will always line up this way. Negative 4x times negative 1 is what? Positive 4x? Positive 4x. Okay. Well, now doing this subtraction, make sure you account for your signs here. I've got negative 4x to the third power plus 4 to the third power, 0. Uh, oh, there we go. 3x squared minus zero x squared gives me three x squared and uh, four, positive four x squared distribute the negative get minus four x gives us plus zero x and then drop down your minus three just like regular old division again three terms dividing by an expression with three terms so things are looking good here i want three x squared here so that subtracts to zero so i'm going to put plus three right here three times x squared is three x squared three times zero x is plus zero x and three times negative one is negative three. Those are basically the one expression subtract exactly the same thing, get zero. And so what this tells us is that our entire first derivative expression factors as what we just divided by, 
times negative 4x plus 3 that we just found. That's not very pretty, but it's very pretty on the next slide where we summarize it. All right, so what we just did was we factored our first derivative so that we could set it equal to zero and find all of the critical points somewhat easier. So setting this expression equal to zero, we see this. Well, first we say, all right, is it ever undefined? Nope, good to go. And so setting it equal to zero, we get plus or minus one from these two factors. And then we get uh, three quarters from setting that orange factor equal to zero and solving it. So now we know the potential extrema of F on this restriction. Um, and we have those points. Well, when we have X is equal to one, we have to find the related Y value, but this Y value is along that restriction. So we have to substitute X is equal to negative one into that expression to find the relevant Y value, negative one squared plus three. Oh, it's a typo. All right, so I forgot this negative here. There we go. And that'll give us uh, negative one for the X value and positive two from that expression. All right, I didn't forget the negative on this X one, no typo on this one. All right, so then we find that for when X is equal to one, Y is going to be positive two. It's a potential extreme value. Notice these are at the saddle and the maximum that we already found out about, but from the earlier graphs, we saw that yes, those were on our domain restriction. In fact, they were on the curved parabola part of it. So it makes sense that we should find those values again through this process. Remember, it won't always be the case. So you do have to explore the interior of your domain as well. All right, so far we've got that. We've got one more X value to work with. We got to consider what happens when X is equal to three quarters. Again, substituting it into our domain restriction function, we get the output of 39 sixteenths. Okay, last but not least, now we're ready to say, hey, these little guys right here, these little guys never showed up. But by virtue of the fact that they are vertices, they could be the minimum or the maximum value that a function attains. Again, back to Calc 1, it's that same analogy that if you're interested in a function over this, maybe sometimes the minimum value and maximum value happen at the endpoint. So you have to check those vertices as well. Our vertices are um, negative root two comma one and root two comma one. And the way you find that is you say, hey, if we were to extend this down, that's on this sort of upside down parabola. And that's also on the y is equal to one line. So this is gonna be y is equal to one. And we solve one is equal to negative uh, x squared plus three, that's where you get your positive and negative root two. Okay, now this is just a, a big summary of everything we've done so far. So putting it all together, uh, we're gonna put together that all, a list of all the potential inputs that we've found where extreme values might happen over this particular domain restriction. Well, the horizontal line on y equals one, we had two points that we found, negative one, one, and positive one, one. Over the parabola restriction, we have the two points we saw prior in this uh, lecture, negative one, two, and positive one, two, as well as a new point, three quarters, 39 sixteenths. And then last but not least, the vertices of negative root two, one, and root two, one. Now we just need to figure out the output that's related to all these inputs. And I think a nice way to do that is to write a table. And you could probably guess how the table is gonna be structured. I'm gonna, I'm gonna match it up to where these values actually came from. So I don't know how to make it pause and do a one by one reveal with a table like this. So just, there we go, everything all at once. What you need to do is you take all of your particular inputs and you plug them in to your function. That function is going to spit out a number. Well, what was our function? Our function is uh, f is equal to x to the third minus 3x minus y squared plus 4y. OK, so if you go ahead and put negative 1 to the third minus 3 times negative 1 minus, well, y is 1, so that's going to be minus 1 squared plus 4 times 1 you're going to get five. So f of one, negative one comma one is going to be five. And that's how we get that. So you do that for every single one of these. And as a, a tip for this, if you type f of x, y equals, 
that expression into Desmos, you can then just type f of negative one one, and it will evaluate it for you. GeoGebra has a similar feature. Um, so yeah, go ahead and make yourself a table. And then what remains to happen is I'm going to get rid of these highlights because they make it look like those are special, something we're interested in. And actually, they're not. What are we interested in? We want to find the extreme values over this restricted domain. We're not interested in saddle points. We're just interested in extreme values. And so what is the overall minimum value that we see? Whoops, not a highlighter here. Well, the smallest output I see is one. Now, what's the biggest output we see? Six. So it looks like the maximum value is attained at that maximum that we happened to find earlier. Again, that's a coincidence on the parabola boundary. But then the minimum value over this, over this domain restriction occurs somewhere on the y is equal to one line boundary. So let's take a look at that. Again, one last note. Note potential extrema on the bound that we found were all on the boundary, but that's not always the case. They could be on the interior or something like that. Well, let's go ahead and verify that. Take a look at this, this graph. Oh, I've already got it open. There we go. Don't even need to re wait for it to reload. Now, if we sort of move this graph around, you can see that sure enough, that minimum value on that y is equal to one is the lowest value that we're gonna attain. You can sort of see that it's a little bit lower than that other point on the parabola of the domain restriction, if you will. So sure enough, there's our minimum value. Now for the maximum value, there's the top of that little hump, if you will, uh, that same maximum value that, that we found for local maximum overall. But since our domain restriction goes through that, it happens to be that that was the highest value. Now, real quick, before I bring this to an end, let's draw what a what if. Let's just say what if. Well, what if our domain restriction had been something like this? You know, and then it kind of comes down there and joins the parabola. Well, in that case, maybe this maximum would no longer be the maximum, but maybe the maximum value would have been attained over here at the vertex. So it's a coincidence that our maximum happened to also be that, that uh, local maximum that we had prior seen. And that brings it to an end for uh, looking at extrema and how to found them, find them and classify them.